All right. So let the gem dropping continue. Um, hope everyone is taking copious notes. I see so many uh, amazing comments in the chat, um, lots of connections happening. So that's really exciting. Continue to do that as well as um, don't forget to uh, sign up for our newsletter. Um, definitely visit www.blackwomentalktech.com. Um, that is where you will be able to find uh, information on um, our future uh, con convenings, our future events, as well as um, getting the recap from, from the summit. So um, without further ado, let us continue on our schedule. Uh, next conversation will focus on business assessment, tips for lowering burn and lengthening operations um, with none other than Catherine Finney, uh, founder and CEO of Digital Undivided, and uh, Ms. Cheryl Conti, CEO of the digital agency Do Big Things and author of Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success. Take it away, ladies. Hi, it's so great to be with everyone today. Catherine, can you hear me? Is Catherine on? Okay, well, I imagine she's she's still on her way on her way up. So, she, um, Catherine, I've promoted you. You should be on your way up. If you need to be to do that again, please send me a message. But, um, Cheryl, if you want to do an introduction, short, really quickly. Sure, I'd love to do an introduction. Well, thank you for the kind pre-duction. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm the CEO of Do Big Things. Do Big Things is a digital agency that specializes in helping uh, the world's leading causes and campaigns with the new narrative and new tech for the new era in which we all find ourselves living. So clients include folks like uh, Lieutenant Colonel Amy McGrath, who is kicking Mitch McConnell's butt in uh, Kentucky. Uh, so look forward to that in the election. Uh, we work with uh, corporations like Etsy, uh, NBC Universal, Salesforce.org, uh, Google. Uh, we work with foundations like Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and Bullet Foundation. Uh, we work with uh, amazing nonprofits like the NAACP, Color of Change, the Movement for Black Lives, uh, Every Town for Gun Safety, League of Conservation Voters, you name the cause. Uh, and we are often the intel inside, helping with the technology. Uh, I'm really proud to be an advisor uh, to Digital Undivided. Uh, I've known Catherine Finney, uh, who uh, is also well known as the uh, budget fashionista. Uh, you know, she is a real pioneer in the startup space. Uh, Digital Undivided is dedicated to helping uh, female entrepreneurs of color uh, to succeed and to do research that didn't even exist. Um, on you know the challenges and successes uh, that uh, that group faces uh, in in the marketplace. Uh, I'm also known as uh, for my work with Attentively. Uh, Attentively uh, was a tech startup uh, that uh, combined social listening, marketing automation, and influencer engagement for. Uh, targeted at the causes and campaign sector. Uh, it was a social impact startup uh, that was acquired by a social impact corporation. It's also the first tech startup, as far as we know, with a black female founder on board, myself, to have been acquired by a NASDAQ corporation, which was Blackbaud. Uh, so I'm really proud of that work. You know, it was out of that work that um, I co-founded with Van Jones of CNN, an old friend, uh, Yes We Code. And Yes We Code is all about helping over 100,000 low opportunity youth of many colors uh, to become high quality coders because our jobs are dope, right? Uh, more people should know that and, and see that as a path to success. And then I also wrote a book, uh, as mentioned, called Mechanical Bull, uh, how you can achieve startup success. It's available on Amazon. It's been uh, a number one bestseller in some Amazon categories. Uh, I hope that um, you take a look. It's only $6.99. And if you find me on LinkedIn, you might convince me to send it to you for free. Uh, I wrote it because it's the book that I wish that I'd had um, when I had a startup. Uh, and it gives you, it's really funny. I hope you find it entertaining, but it also has very, very practical down to earth nuts and bolts uh, information on you know how to get over, how to get through every stage of the startup life cycle. So I think that Catherine has joined. Catherine, can you hear me? 
I can hear you. Let me make sure I got uh, doing everything I'm supposed uh, to do. Thanks everyone for being patient. Uh, we're gonna have, Catherine and I have known each other you know, for a really long time, uh, fortunately. Uh, it's been, you know, she's been in some ways a mentor to me and to so many others. I really look up to her. And I think that, um, you know, you guys are in for a real treat. Uh, you know, she has been a pioneer uh, in our space as a black woman in tech in so, so many ways. Um, so I'm really excited. Oh, there she is for fabulous glasses and even more fabulous lipstick. Look at that. Thank you. Hey girl. 99 from, you know, the Black Lady Beauty Supply. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes that is the best stuff. Wet and Wild used to be yeah, a brand. Exactly. I don't even think it's Wet and Wild. It's not even the brand. It's like <laughs> some name, <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> Well, uh, I could talk about lipstick all day and I have a lot of thoughts on that. This is actually a brand that I got, it was a speaker gift. It was like a little gift bag and I loved it so much. And it ended up, and when I went to get some more, it ended up being only available in the Philippines. But using the magic of the internet, which it took some magic, uh, I was able to find a US distributor. Um, but you know, it works with my skin tone. This is the, you know, the new economy where we're visible. You know, yes, people exactly, different, exactly. right? We are very visible. Uh, so, Catherine, welcome. You know, first off, I'd love to hear. You know, you know, just check in with you. How are you? How is digital undivided in this time of COVID nineteen? And and what approach is digital undivided um, doing? You know, to you know, helping Black women entrepreneurs through this this struggle. Yeah. Well, first, I would like to say I'm really excited to be here. I think we're in a really unique time, um, personally, nationally, globally, right? We're all in the middle of this and it's a really unique time to be a leader too and running things um, and running things as a black woman. <laughs> um, and so it's really interesting, you know, I did, there's a lot of things that we've done. We were fortunate that we already were very tech centered. So the transition to using the Zooms and stuff like that, um, and sort of these remote communication tools and Slacks were things that we were already doing because we we're a pretty distributed workforce. We have a, an office in Atlanta, we have, our headquarters is in Newark. Um, I'm always like on some plane. So we were always using these sort of tools um, and it was just transitioning to that more so. Um, programmatically, we had to sit down and ask ourselves, how do we sort of, where is, where is our impact now, right? So what's going on with our community um, when we can't gather? So we had our big incubator. It was inside our space. And if you haven't been to one of our spaces, they're like incredible and they're really super cool. And, but we couldn't do it, right? We can't have these sort of gatherings. So how do we have our impact now? And what does that look like? And I think everyone who's running a company and organization are faced with that right now. Like, what do we do under this new space? And so one of the things that we did was we sat down and we looked at all the stuff we did. And we said, what what can be virtual? What what can be changed? And so we took one of our programs. It was probably one of the most popular things we did, which was our START program. And we blew it up into something bigger. Um, and START is a program, we call it Lean Startup for the Hood. Uh, it's sort of an intro to using Lean Startup to in that methodology and those principles to build and get started with your company. Um, and it wasn't just for people in tech. We had folks who were doing, you know, hair salons. We had people who were, you know, selling weaves. Like I love, love that. Waist trainers. We had one company that was selling waist trainers on um, Instagram. She's clearing like half a mil a year <laughs> selling waist trainers. I love it. Um, I no, have one, I'm not going to lie. It's a really good product. Yeah. Um, and so they were using these principles to grow their companies. And we took start and we made it larger. It was just like a little weekend, kind of a pathway into our big incubator. And we took it and we made it into a larger program. So now it's three weeks, it's virtual, it's guided, it's direct mentorship and also some group things online. Um, it's actually led with, by one of our uh, founders from one of our programs named Jasmine Edwards. Um, and we have our first cohort is happening in June. And so make sure you guys apply for it. Um, 
but yeah, we, we have to sit down and think. We also were quite aware of like what position Digital and Divided has in the space of being able to frankly do stuff and not ask permission. Um, and that's a real privileged position to be in as, as a Black woman. Um, it's also, you know, I kind of have a, you know, don't give a F sort of <laughs> attitude as well, um, you know, do it and then ask for permission later. And so um, I was faced with a particular challenge. My family usually takes a vacation around my birthday. My birthday is in April. Um, and this past year, we weren't going to be able to go anywhere. We actually... Um, was scheduled to go on a cruise to Alaska um, from Seattle. So needless to say, we weren't going anywhere, right? And, and also I was scheduled to go see my grandparents who were, who were in a nursing home and my grandmother has dementia and I wasn't able to go see them. And that's really painful. I'm very close to my grandmother and I'm named after her. And so I was feeling really kind of depressed and down and my birthday was coming up and all these different things and wanted to do something. And, and just decided really without, you know, a lot of strategy or thought, like I'm gonna use the money that I would have used for vacation to support other black women entrepreneurs. And I'm gonna name it after my grandmother who influenced me beyond measure. I'm here because of her, um, literally and figuratively, I'm here because of her. And, and her life as a single mom, as an entrepreneur, and all the summers I would spend with her um, had a profound impact on me. Uh, and it's the reason why I started my first company, The Budget Fashionista. It's the reason why I continue to do what I'm doing. And so use that money to start something um, in her honor. Originally was only going to be able to fund 50 um, Black women entrepreneurs. The idea was that we were going to give these micro investments of $100 for Black women entrepreneurs to use in whatever way you want to use it. Um, if it's to get your utilities paid, cool. If it's to, you know, get your hair did because you need that in order to feel good and empowered to be able to do this hard work that we do as entrepreneurs, then so be it. But it's an investment in you and you use it whatever way you think is best. Um, we are, we have so far, so it started with 50 in less than a month, we have made over 600 micro investments on our way to a thousand by next week. Um, and it's really interesting how this has, um, not only just the, you know, micro investment we made and, and the help with that, but the impact that's had on staff that did, um, cause we're all in this, right? Um, we're all in this and to me, what has been the, the biggest impact is to see how staff has like changed too. It helped link to our humanity as well. Um, and you know, when you're in the middle of doing stuff and you're trying to survive, and you're trying to get things done and you're in this pandemic and your kids are bugging you and everybody's up, you know, to have that moment to be able to connect to your humanity has been really the greatest gift. Um, and so that's what we did. We were like, what can we do? Um, we have some other programming that we have coming up. Project Diane is still on track. That's the good part about Project Diane. It wasn't dependent on being in person, but we have some bold things that we're gonna be doing um, and pushing things forward. Cause I think now is the time for us as entrepreneurs, as women of color leaders to, to do so. Oh yeah, I love what you're saying about connecting to our humanity and certainly, you know, here, you know, at Do Big Things, you know, we've been very much, you know, I, we had uh, one of our senior executives come to a call and it was clear that she was super stressed in a way that she normally is. And I was like, look, if, you know, and she confessed she's having some challenges with homeschooling. I was like, look, Ooh, girl. <laughs> right, which is pretty, that's pretty stand par for the course at this point. I said, look, I'd rather have six hours of you clear, focused, happy, productive, you know, and you take two hours to get your, your daughter, you know, 
squared away with homeschool in the morning than eight hours of you super stressed, like not as productive, right? Like that's like, we all just have to support each other. But in that uh, interest, you know, you mentioned Project Diane uh, and uh, it's been groundbreaking. You know, it, I don't think that the ID even get the did gets the credit that it deserves for how, you know, groundbreaking that research has been. You know, are you doing research now on uh, black women, black and brown, um, entrepreneurs, uh, female entrepreneurs during COVID-19? Are there any findings that are surprising and how does that then tie in with Project Diane? Yeah, we are really lucky. Um, we have an amazing director of research, Lucy Turley, who um, has done work, particularly looking at the women who have applied for the Dooney Fund. So we have about 3,000 women, Black and Latinx women who have applied for the Dooney Fund and looking at how COVID is impacting us. Because, um, you know, whatever happens to everyone happens to us like 10 times more. Um, and some of the things that have come out, none of it's really surprising. I think what is surprising is the variety of businesses that have been impacted. Um, and that has been really, really surprising. So it's not just the hair salons and those who are doing in-person servicing, which you kind of expect to have direct impact, but it's also the uh, startups. Um, a number of startups have also been recipients of the Dooney Fund. And that's been really interesting to see um, because the belief is that, you know, investors are going to start to support. Uh, we're actually seeing on with a lot of entrepreneurs that the investment, particularly angel and even some of the more VC institutional investment is starting to really contract quite a bit. Um, and we're seeing that have an impact or it's taking a long time. Um, we're noticing that almost every woman who has applied has been impacted and the impact has been particularly acute because many have indicated a good percentage, I think over 70%, that they only have about a six month runway before they're gonna be in real trouble. Um, and many said less than six months, like three months. Um, and that's really concerning when you look at things like the PPP loan effort where we, disproportionately did not receive that funds. It's something like 95% of black companies will not be eligible to get those funds because we don't have, we're eligible, but we're, we're not part of either, we don't have direct relationships with a banker. Um, we don't have all these sort of barriers. So yes, we are eligible based upon what the SBA says, but to actually get them, here's what you need to have. Um, and so we're seeing how that's having a big impact and we don't have a lot of runway. Um, on the upside though, we're seeing this idea of really like black women entrepreneurs in particular, really figuring out like, how do we work through this? And I think it's because we are used to having limited resources. Um, and I don't say that as a, a good thing, but because of that, we are uniquely skilled to be able to go through this period um, in terms of figuring out how to place limited resources where other communities may not have been able to really develop those skills because they've never had a lack of resources like we have. Um, we shouldn't be in that position, but it's interesting how we're uniquely empowered. And so we're seeing a lot of that reflected in the data too of this optimism of, I'm gonna figure this out, because I've had to figure it out all the time anyway. So this is nothing new of being in sort of this position. Well, yeah, I mean, you know the saying, you know, black women make a way out of no way, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, we've had no choice really in some ways, but uh, to um, be, you know, be uh, creative, resourceful, resilient, uh, and right, you know, this that's something that can help us in this time. So, you know, on that same topic, you know, what would you, what advice would you give to a founder right now in this time? You know, how do people start to rethink their business models, their cash flow, their, their market dynamics? You know, what, what advice are you giving to folks or what are you seeing that's working? Yeah, I mean, I think the challenge right now is 
discussions around things like, you know, very detailed sort of tactical things like, you know, how, what, what business model is going to work, um, what the market is going to do. To be really honest, no one knows the answer to that. Um, and people who say they do, um, they're not telling you the truth. No one knows because we've never been in a global pandemic. The last time was a hundred years ago. Um, so we're in a we're in a lot of new territory. I think the question is, what do you do when when there's uncertainty, right? Um, and the thing is, that from a business perspective, one of the things that you do is you reduce your fixed costs as much as possible. Um, and there's a lot of tough decisions that have to be made. So I think one of the areas where we're going to see a lot of changes is probably in real estate. So we have two locations that did that we are currently paying leases on, right? And we can't use the space and don't know when we'll be able to use the space, particularly our space in Newark. We may not be able to get in for a year. Um, and so we're talking about a year of lease payments, fixed costs that we're paying for a space that we can't use. Um, and so I think, you know, there's gonna be some changes with leases. And unfortunately, you know, it's hard to get out of a lease, a commercial lease in particular. It's very, very hard to get out of commercial lease. So I think as a business thinking about what fixed costs are really necessary. Like, what do you actually have to have. Do you actually need an office space, office space? Um, are there other options? I think that may be the savior of co-working actually, is the fact that it's not really a, a fixed, they turned the fixed cost into a variable cost basically. Um, and so stuff like that. And I would, it is going to be tough decisions as a business owner, um, even in terms of staffing, right? Like um, particularly if you have staff that are payroll, you know, W-2 staff, um, 1099 staff, I think we're going to see a lot more of freelancers because that's not as much of a fixed cost as W-2s where you, you pay payroll and you pay payroll tax and you pay unemployment and you pay health care and all these like really costs that are going to have to be reassessed. And it's going to be a very tough period for us to rethink these sort of things. Um, but it's really this question of what's necessary to really run your business. Yeah. I mean, my, my counsel would be prioritize payroll. You know, that's, yeah. the, you know, we were lucky. We were fortunate to get a PPP um, yeah. loan, which is forgivable, but we didn't get it in the first round. Yeah. Um, you know, I suspect there will be a third round of funding. So go ahead and apply folks if you haven't applied, uh, cause you might get it, you know, third time's the charm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, you know, prioritize payroll, you know, your utilities, your rent, you know, some of that, you know, you have to check the laws and, and monitor the laws in your state, but, you know, those, you may get a break for, for some of those, you know, people, but, you know, your people come first really yes. is, is the key. Um, but yeah, I think all of those trends make sense to me. Um, so, uh, let's see, do you want to ask me any questions? No, I mean, I think as a founder, like what, um, I think you just answered one of the ones I would ask, which is like, what do you prioritize? But, you know, as a founder who's received venture funding um, and investment, like what do you see as happening in that space, um, particularly for those who are looking for investment? I think everyone, no matter who you are, is going to feel, um, you know, like, oh, I need to pull up, reevaluate, reassess. And I think the angel and uh, VC community is in that same boat. You know, they, for some of them, you know, the stock market is starting to bubble back up a little bit, but they've still, you know, experienced some losses and we're all facing quite a lot of uncertainty. And so I think that you're absolutely right that um, angels and VCs are likely to be much more conservative uh, you know, deals that might have been on the table might get pushed back. You know, deals that were under consideration might get postponed indefinitely. Uh, so I think that uh, you're going to have to be aggressive. You know, I'll tell you what, I was talking to a, a, uh, a major angel network that focuses on female entrepreneurs who will remain unnamed. Um, and uh, they told me, look, you know, we 
we're trying hard to focus on uh, you know, black female entrepreneurs and, and promote them. You know, we, they're, they're a longstanding organization. And, you know, they found that, you know, they were able to eliminate a whole lot of bias in the process until it got to people signing checks. Yeah. It was, it was when people had to actually sign a check where things, you know, went awry. And they also found that they had to you know, it just took a lot longer. And that was my experience as an entrepreneur. You know, their experience was, you know, where for a white or Asian American uh, startup entrepreneur, you know, founder, it would take maybe seven to 10 contacts. And for black female entrepreneurs, it took 50. It took 50 to get the same level of interest. And, you know, I think that that might be a little worse. I mean, you're going to have to you know, in this next probably year to 24 months, you know, you're going to have to knock on a few more doors and be a little more persistent, aggressive, you know, show your numbers um, than you would ordinarily. That doesn't mean you should give up. That does not mean that you should lose hope. I think that there's still quite a lot of interest, um, you know, and passion for diversifying portfolios uh, among angels and VCs. Uh, but I do think that, you know, you're, it, it's going to be a little more challenging. You know, that's real and it may take longer. And therefore, as you said, you know, you have to really look at your runway. If conventional wisdom in the past and the before times, conventional wisdom was that it took six to 12 months to raise a round, you know, it may take longer. It may take 18 months to raise that round. And I want to even see like refocusing. I feel like we've spent, we've given too much power to VCs and angel investors when really, and particularly I see this with women of color, they 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 have a lot of power in our space, not the same level of power that they have with our colleagues that are of other races, right? And so I think for us, it's like, how do we do this without needing them? Um, you should only be really going for angel investment in VC and any sort of investment to just fuel where you go next, right? Because you you get an investor, you take on the boss, plain and simple, right? So if you're if you're bringing on investment, it should be to fuel you to go to the next step. Um, so how do we build it ourselves without needing that? Um, because I do think we're in a period where it's going to be really difficult to get people to actually write the check. And so one of the things that often happen is we'll have founders who are like, oh, I have a meeting with such and such, and they're really excited, right? I have this meeting with this investor and it's gonna be really exciting. And I was like, you know, that's great. And everyone will take a meeting um, to all the entrepreneurs out there who are raising, everyone will meet with you. Like the, the meeting is not the goal. The question is when it comes to writing the actual check. Um, and so I would say to founders of color right now, is and women founders and focus on those who you know write the checks meaning people who have proven and have invested in other people like you because you only have so much time um and you only have so much space and you don't want to be spending all of your time when you should be building your company chasing after people for whom they're just never going to write you the check but they want to be able to say that they met with X, Y, and Z. Like one of the biggest um, metrics on the VC side is to say, you know, because VCs have to record how much deal flow they get, right? How many people they meet. And they need to be able to say, well, I met with 200, you know, black women of the thousand meetings that I took. They have to do that to report to their LPs. What's interesting is until recently, no one was asking them, well, how many did you actually invest in, right? And so for you as an entrepreneur with the limit to time, particularly if you're a woman, particularly if you're a mother or a partner or you have other responsibilities, like focus on those who write the check. Um, and it's not that hard. And if you talk to others in this space, if you talk to the Cheryls and other people who have raised significant amount of VC funding, you will hear the 20 to 30 VCs who've actually written checks or you know, the 50 to 100 angel investors who've actually invested in a woman of color. And so start there is what I would say. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. Um, <clears throat> you know, and work with the network, you know, like yeah. actually, you know, look in your network, you know, if you have one, you know, to see, you know, right, you know, who has invested in them, that might be a good lead 
for you, you know, you mentioned the micro grants, and I'm, I'm, I actually want to dig a little deeper into that. You know, how are people, how are women using those micro grants, and you know, what learnings right now can founders take from from those companies and other companies right now? So they're using it in a variety of ways. Um, you know, some are using it for sort of basic things like paying utilities. There's others who are using it to pay for web hosting. Um, and there's others who are using it to live, <laughs> you know? And so I think one of the lessons that can be, as a founder, can be taken from these founders is you as a woman of color need to do and create the support, the infrastructure that helps you do what it is that you do. Um, and really kind of, you know, F anyone who doesn't get it. Um, there is, I was explaining to someone the challenges of being a Black woman leader, um, which is very, very different. Um, the calls on my time. I actually sat down and wrote down how many people depend on me to, to exist. Um, and it was 33. Like 33 people directly depend on me from staff to family to, to for me to be able to do what I do. So if I take a moment to watch The Real Housewives of Atlanta, which is my one of my guilty pleasures, because that helps me get my mind right. Um, or if you're a founder and you have to spend time, money, doing whatever it is that helps you get yourself right, because you are taking care of so many people, then do that. What I find in this space, um, particularly in the tech part of it, but entrepreneurship in general, those things that help support us are incredibly devalued. Um, those are not looked at as things that are necessities, right? Whereas, you know, other things are given value to it. And so what we're finding is the founders are using it in whatever way they want to use it. And I love it. The, the true learning from this has been how directly this notion of just giving money to Black women and Black women knowing how to use it has challenged some people in this space. And so the, the yeah. discussions I've had about, you know, in the same breath, someone will say, well, $100 is not enough. And then literally the next sec sec sentence would be, well, how do you make sure that they're using it correctly? I'm like, so either it's not enough, but so it's not enough, but you're worried about how they're going to use this amount that's not enough, right? And what you find is like this real challenging notion about whose economic output is valued, um, whose work is valued, and so that's the, one of the biggest lessons we've learned of how this concept of us knowing what's best for our businesses and for our lives and how that's like directly challenging a lot of these notions of money and who gets it and why does it take us 50 when it only takes someone else seven, you know, all of these sort of things is because it's this concept of whose economic output is value. Um, and that's what it comes down to. And, and that has been fascinating and interesting. But, you know, we're in the middle of pandemic and I'm feeling particularly emboldened and my community is suffering like no other community is. And I've, you know, I've earned the right to be able to say they can use it whatever the effing way they want to use it. Um, I don't usually put the F in there, but you know, whatever way they the seem is, deem is best. Black women know what's best to do with their businesses and their lives. And we trust that that is happening. Yeah, no, we deserve trust and respect. And that's at the core of this, that you know, if someone is questioning what we're gonna do with a hundred dollars, that's just yes, not right? that's just not respectful. Like, <laughs> you're not like, trusting us to make the real television. question that you're really trying to get at. And so that has been really interesting. And I think the biggest lesson to take from that is, you know, as a founder, you know what's best for your company and feel solid in that, that you know what is best. Because at this point, um, particularly where the world is right now, we literally don't, no one knows the answer. So people may, you know, say that they, they don't know the answer. You actually know the answer more than them. Um, I always think back to, um, you know, one of the challenges that I've had of being like, you know, a woman of color leader and always kind of like, second guessing myself. So I remember when we 
first ended our Focus 100 conference, which was this conference that we had for two years starting 2012 and it was the last conference in 2014. And we wanted to expand our incubator um, concept. We had started with this virtual and we went to expand it to this in-person and we went to go look for data. And there was like no data at this time in 2014. There was no data on Black women in tech and founders. There was no data really on women. Um, and I remember talking to my husband and being like, man, I don't know what to do. Like, you know, we want to get support, but we can't quantify the problem. So it's really hard for people to understand that it is a problem. And, you know, he said to me in his very pragmatic way, he's like, didn't you go to Yale for epidemiology? Like, don't you, like, you graduated with like honors and stuff, right? Like, didn't we just pay that loan off? So why don't you do the research? Like, you're literally a researcher. <laughs> like, why don't you do it? And I remember as I'm thinking like, yeah, I can do it, but why wasn't that the first thought that I had? Like, why didn't I think that I had the knowledge and the power to just go off and do it? Because that's what our counterparts do. They don't ask for permission. They don't question, I mean, they literally don't question their intellect. Even they may not know nothing about research, but they're like, I'm gonna go out and be, do this research. And why don't we do the same? And I think right now we have an opportunity um, as, as women of color leaders and entrepreneurs to do exactly that because nobody knows, like nobody knows anything right now. Oh yeah, uh, you know, I um, everything you said resonates uh, with me, certainly. I've had similar experience and sometimes honestly, you know, and this is advice, it might be in the book, uh, my book, Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success, available on Amazon, uh, you know, is find that inner white dude. Like, you know that white dude who just uh, does not care and will just like, you know, blunder. And we have one in the White House, as an example. Yeah. Like, if you don't know one personally, there's one that's watching, you know, he feels very- All important. bets are off. After um, you came in, you can do whatever the hell you want to do. He's, he's the smartest guy in any room, according to him. And, you know, how can how do we find that confidence uh, we have, uh, we're, we need to wrap up, but I do, there was uh, someone who had a quick question, which was, uh, how do people find uh, START? Uh, how do you find yeah. um, the, the three-week Lean Startup Summit? Yeah, there's a couple of ways. You can go to digitalunddivided.com. Um, you can follow us, you know, on the gram. And also, um, we're on everything, like Ram, Twitter. It's We're like so not hard to find. <laughs> so beautiful. Um, and so you can definitely tweet us. It's a long URL, so that's why I don't want to like, you know, mention it. It's like Digital Divide, I think. Um, and there's our applications like f6s.com slash start. But if you go to f6s, which is the application system that everyone uses for all the incubator accelerator programs, if you're not on f6s, you probably should be anyway, if you're looking at, you know, sort of more resources, because it's a great place to be. Um, if you type in digital and divided, or you start type in start 2020, you will also find us that way too. Um, but it's also on our pages, on our Instagram, things like that. That's and great. And also, if you have additional questions, like feel free to tweet us and um, reach out. Uh, we're pretty open. Um, we've been in this, you know, these streets for a long time. <laughs> we've been in these streets for a long time. And so the, you know, things that I share are from just what I've seen and lessons learned from being in this space. Um, and we can do this. We're in, you know, it's times of, of periods of great challenge are also periods of great opportunity. And I think there is a opportunity for us as women of color to redefine how this space works. Um, we can do that. We can redefine how these things are, are happening. And we have the knowledge to do that. Um, Absolutely. We can yeah. step into that leadership gap. You know, we can step into that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ideas gap, you know, with our leadership, with our ideas, with our unique ability, again, to make a way out of no way. You we know, know we how have, to do this. Yeah, we, we, we already know how to do this. Uh, in ways that other people don't. So uh, I'm really, I'm so, oh, somebody posted a direct link, which is great to the startup application. Thank you. There's a lot of great stuff in the chat. I've 
we shared uh, links to Digital Undivided, uh, to Catherine's social media platforms. There's some stuff there for me. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to see you there. Please check out the book. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for thank spending time so with us. And thanks to BWTT. So